All right. Welcome everyone to Let's Get Visual, Visual New Instructional Approaches for Visual Literacy. Uh, this event is brought to you by the ACRL Instruction Section Teaching Methods Committee. Um, so attendees, just please use the chat box to ask any questions throughout the presentation and then uh, our speakers will answer questions at the end during a Q&A period. <coughs> Excuse me. So our speakers today are Dana Staten Thompson, Sarah Schumacher, and Maggie Murphy. Dana is a research and instruction librarian and assistant professor at Murray State University, where she teaches courses on information literacy and serves as a liaison to the College of Business. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> she holds an MLIS, MA in Art History, and MFA in Studio Art from Louisiana State University and a BA in journalism from Washington and Lee University. Her research and teaching interests focus on the intersection of visual literacy and news literacy, <laughs> the integration of visual literacy instruction into higher education, and the scholarship of teaching and learning. She serves as the vice president for International Visual Literacy Association. Sarah is the architecture image librarian at Texas Tech University Libraries and works to improve visual media resources and promote visual literacy through discipline specific and professional applications. <clears throat> she received an MA in art history from the University of Oregon and an MS in information studies from the University of Texas at Austin. Her research interests include ethical concerns surrounding using and creating visual media and navigating emerging, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, visual literacy competencies and knowledge practices. She serves as the current vice president for conference program for the Visual Resources Association. Maggie is an assistant professor and first year writing visual art and humanities librarian at UNC Greensboro. She is also <coughs> a lecturer for San Jose State's University's iSchool, where she teaches a course on visual resources and art librarianship. Maggie received an MLIS from Rutgers University and has previously worked as an editorial assistant for the College Art Association's Art Journal and as the visual resources curator at Queens College CUNY. <laughs> she is interested in interdisciplinary approaches to visual literacy instruction improving subject access to art images and working with art students on critical and ethical information creation and use. So I am happy to turn this over to our speakers if you want to start start sharing your screen. Sure, I can do that. Um, hi, everybody. This is Dana Thompson. I am going to get to our presentation and go ahead and get that started. So I'm going to also turn on my captions and here they are. So uh, yeah, our presentation today is called Let's Get Visual, Visual, um, and I am going to attempt to advance the slides. I ha do have a question. Um, can y'all, oh, sorry. When I start the presentation, it takes up my entire screen. So if anybody is chatting at me, I, I cannot see it. Um, all right, I will advance the slides. So yes, um, we are um, members of the ACRL Visual Literacy Task Force. This is the second Visual Literacy Task Force. And um, we're gonna present in this order. I am Dana Thompson, as you all know, and my presentation is about teaching students to critically read images. Um, this is based off of an article that I published in the Journal of Visual Literacy. I've got a link there, um, but this is the title, so you could find it that way through Google Scholar. Um, the main instructional learning outcomes were that students will be able to identify different types of images as shallow or deep uh, that they encounter on the internet and social media platforms. Um, usually I'm thinking about um, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, uh, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing that I wanted students to be able to do was that they would actually use uh, this thing called the DIG method. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later on. So the first thing 
in this uh, presentation is really about the difference between shallow and deep images. So this is kind of terminology that stems from uh, shallow and deep looking, which is an emerging kind of field in visual studies. And so I'm referring to images as shallow and deep in that um, here, as you see as an example, are kind of two what we might think of like typical internet social media images, right? So on the left, we see, you know, a social media influencer. And on the right, we have a meme. Um, memes can be difficult uh, here when they are usually of pets or uh, internet personalities. They don't usually require uh, too much additional um, investigation, right? Um, so they're generally meant to entertain. They do not have a deeper meaning. Um, for examples of deep images, I frequently think about things that um, play different roles, such as charts or graphs, um, maybe advertising photographs, uh, journalistic photographs. Um, and these to me require further investigation because they can have several intents and meanings. Um, in addition to the fact that most students are not taught how to um, understand or read charts and graphs and sometimes these journalistic photographs. Um, one of the additional reasons to investigate these types of images is because these images could be uh, misleading, they could be used to persuade you, or they could be used to sell you something. Um, so they really shouldn't be read at what I call a surface level. Uh, the idea is that students who use visual literacy and critical thinking skills can sidestep perhaps any manipulation um, and become, you know, what I might call a discerning citizen. So I created this thing uh, that I entitled the dig method. Um, and so there are multiple methods for evaluating information. Um, everybody here is probably familiar with the crap method. Um, but I could not find any widely used methods for evaluating images. Um, so I created this dig method to address that perceived gap. Uh, it's based off of three main sources. So I did find questions in a research guide, uh, University of California, Irvine um, in 2010 created um, a, a, a research guide about how to evaluate digital images. And then um, there are also questions that I found in Anne Bramford's Visual Literacy White Paper. The third thing were a series of questions I found about visual literacy in the um, Visual Literacy for Librarians book, which was written by the first task force. So I organized this DIG method uh, according to these four steps of critical reading. These four steps are outlined um, by Karen Mannerin in her article from 20, well, in her book from 2015. And um, they are analyzing, interpreting, evaluating, and comprehending. So I came up with this series of questions to kind of address these four components of critical reading. Uh, DIG stands for Digital Image Guide. It's kind of this play on digging deeper into images. So um, this is the lesson outline that I developed to utilize this DIG method um, in reference to the ACRL visual literacy standards. Um, you can learn more about both standards um, in this recommended read project I, I um, did on visual literacy today. A lot of information there. It's an online bibliography. But so this is a pretty short lesson. You can do it in a typical one shot. And um, there's an introduction, um, and I utilized it in a journalism class, but you could really use this in a lot of different capacities. Um, so, you know, introducing this concept of shallow and deep images, uh, what was really interesting is when you ask the students to provide some examples of what they think these things might be, um, and then showing your own examples and explaining why. Uh, they, you've given them that designation. Um, so what you can also do is um, 
actually have them use the dig method and um, have a discussion um, about a particular image. So um, just to conclude, um, why should you use visuals to ground a lesson? Um, it reinforces this idea that since communication is now more visually oriented, um, you can apply kind of this critical sensibility to that we already employ to text-based communications to visuals as well. Um, and this, you know, by using the DIG method, the students are also taught the importance of critically reading images, which I think um, can fall under the purview of librarians. And I think that it's important to understand that digital images, some of them might be need, we might need to read them at a deeper level. So I'm going to say thank you, and I'm going to turn it over to Sarah at this time. So I'm gonna stop sharing, uh, Sarah, and let you take it over. Okay, thank you. So let me turn on my captions. Okay, oops. Hopefully that is, okay, good. We're all set up. Uh, so again, I'm Sarah Schumacher. I'm the architecture image librarian, uh, which means the examples I'm going to be using in this presentation are architecture images. However, you know, I've previously been a liaison for health sciences and computer sciences. Uh, so I'm going to be focusing on the process of creating and teaching because I really want to show you how you can adapt this method to use in different disciplines you support. Because uh, students generally struggle through similar issues when they learn how to read visual media as sources of information, uh, particularly looking at them through a disciplinary perspective. So first, students can fail to recognize the decisions that authors make when creating, contextualizing, and disseminating visual material. And second, they often don't realize that they can use visual media and captions, citations, metadata, et cetera, to vet their sources. And by breaking down and understanding how the author created something, uh, they're learning that base knowledge in the discipline that can help them later when they need to create their own communications, um, visual, textual, or multimodal, uh, and become contributors in their discipline. So with these learning outcomes, um, I'm primarily thinking about them in terms of the frames authority is constructed and contextual and information creation as a process. So when I started working with architecture students on visual literacy, you know, I quickly realized they have unique needs regarding visual materials as most disciplines do. Uh, one strategy that really helped me was to reflectively question the discipline. And for that, I used questions from Sarah Miller's article. So I have a go slight citation here, but there's a, a full citation at the end of the slides. So thinking about how are marks of authority communicated through visual materials as they are created, as they are integrated into larger communications, and as they are then disseminated on different platforms. So do those visual formats look different in the discipline? So you think about architecture, you know, we have physical models, photorealistic digital renderings. But if you think about economics, maybe you're thinking about charts or histograms of income levels for populations. If you think about these visual materials as evidence in the discipline. So even the same format can look and function very differently in different disciplines. Um, so thinking about like a photograph as a primary source. So in history, it may be documenting an event. In art history, it may be seen as an artwork. In medical fields, you may be documenting a case study. Uh, but they're all created for a purpose, and students really need to understand that purpose in order for them to be able to use them correctly. And this is one of the first activities I do with my freshman architecture majors. 
is I show them two images of the same structure from different sources. So on the left is an image uh, from Arch Daily, which is a popular online blog that's used in the architecture and design community. And right comes from the image collection that I managed at TTU, uh, which is a mix of licensed collections and faculty donations. Uh, for other disciplines, I've used images of politicians, so maybe like a stage campaign or official photo versus a news photo. I've done marketing ads, so maybe like a magazine ad versus Instagram celebrity ad. Uh, you could do graphs and charts from research studies, so maybe something as seen in news media uh, versus something you would see in a scholarly journal article. Really anything that will let you show the different choices that are made in the creation of these visual communications so that students can look more deeply and ask questions about what they see and why. So with these images, I asked students to consider and vote for which they would use for the following purposes and then really explain why they're, why they're voting that way. Uh, for example, you know, many students are going to pick the Arch Daily image as best for critiquing the architect's vision. A lot of times the supporting reasons will be things like you can see the full structure, especially that roof line, how it fits in the natural environment. Um, but a lot of students are going to pick the TTU image to talk about critiquing the use of space because you're seeing people interacting in that space. And this discussion encourages students to look closely at these images and identify what they can and cannot see and understand them as sources for analysis. So after looking and questioning, I direct the students to think about the creation process. So when were these images taken? You know, particularly for this, how long after the pavilion were these photographs taken? Who commissioned the photographs? Uh, often I'll use a quote from architectural photographer John Dunnett, who asks, why does it never rain in Architectural Review, which is one of the major uh, architecture journals? So again, really stressing that these decisions are not made by chance. So photographers making choices, often based on who is paying them. So Arch Daily, for example, the architect or firm is generally providing the images. So then what are they trying to communicate? And would then they provide images that would show failures in the design? And I try to stress to students that they can't label these sources as good or bad, but rather have to understand what biases they have and to question if they may still fit their need. So this discussion really dovetails into learning outcome number two, where I show students how to use visual media and accompanying text to evaluate sources according to authority, point of view, fit for information need, and audiences. Uh, to communicate these ideas, uh, again, I use Sarah Miller's disciplinary questions to break down how architecture information gets disseminated, what it looks like, who's participating, and where and when should students be looking for particular visual materials. So again, this process can look different in each discipline, um, so, you know, I, I have personally uh, enjoyed kind of looking at the different professional websites, trade journals, scholarly journals, books, other formats, and seeing how they are integrating visual materials into their sources. Um, you know, do they look, do, do the visuals look different in the different formats? Are they larger or smaller in certain formats? Are they black and white? versus color? Are there changes in captioning or attribution? Are they used to synthesize, replace, or add context to text? Um, so you can start then to maybe put together something about the publishing timeline. So this is something I first created. I mean, it works for the textual as well, uh, but I created it with the images in mind. So it starts you know, with the social media like Arch Daily, all the way through uh, image collections like Art Store. And so I encourage students to think about the questions they have about the topic, the architect, the building, and think about what that longer to publication time can mean. So that means probably additional hands on the material, peer review, vetting, editing, uh, but also can mean that additional critical analysis 
that I fitting the building into the career trajectory, um, seeing if it was influential or not. And then I, I take them through each type of source and we break down what we see. So for example, in trade professional journals, I point students to think about what information is present, what types of visuals, how is text used in conjunction with these visuals. And I really stress the space is money. So physical resources, you have the materials cost, but in digital format, you also have, you know, that placement. So what information is given prime space? What's highlighted? What's surrounded by white space? Is there things that are larger or something, you know, maybe it's all the way in the corner, you have to scroll all the way down to find it. And once you re recognize what information you find, start talking about why is it included. Uh, for this example, I point to the project credits, which I put up here, and asking, you know, how many people are credited on this? And who cares about that? Who cares about who the structural consultant is? Who cares that they use Douglas fir? And then think about credibility and trustworthiness. So who's providing this information and to whom? Um, so it's professional journal. So most of this stuff is coming from the firms. Um, so then you have to kind of go back and use what, what they learned in learning outcome number one about understanding the choices made and the purpose. But also understanding the audience. The audience is professionals. Um, so they are understanding this in a certain way. They're able to, to spot outright deceptions, but they also understand the ingrained biases. And they also you know, need to understand what is missing, what is not included, because this goes into publication so soon. We don't have that additional critical context going on. And then, so I do this for all the different types, including art store, you know, with art store, a lot of times we'll talk about the differences between um, what you're going to see. So you see more on description, more on period, and not so much on that creator. So again, that audience is broader. It's more multidisciplinary. Um, and you can talk, talk about that, how that impacts what we are seeing and what uh, information we may have to be vetting. Uh, so I hope that my process and implementation uh, can be something that you can use to help certain st students recognize the purpose of visual media and use that information and accompanying text to evaluate sources uh, based on authority, on bias, on fit for information need, and audiences and purposes. Um, so with that, I will stop my share uh, and hand it over to Maggie. Hello, everybody. Um, let me get to my first slide, which I thought I had loaded. There we go. Okay. Um, so uh, I am a visual art and humanities librarian. Um, I work with a variety of disciplines, uh, including the School of Art at UMCG, um, which is studio art, art history, and art education, but also uh, philosophy, religious studies, um, history, and I also work with our first year writing program. Um, and so I have a variety of experiences uh, with teaching information literacy in different disciplines um, and developing lesson plans that are really geared towards my students' assignments. Um, and because of that, I've found that uh, outside of the art disciplines, I don't really get to spend as much time on the uh, creation process of visual information um, in course-based information literacy uh, sessions as I do obviously with studio art students or art education students. Um, and because of that, uh, I have thought a lot about how to reach students outside of disciplines, um, outside of disciplinary instruction on these crucial visual literacy um, competencies or uh, dispositions, ways of thinking about visual information. Um, so my colleagues and I uh, this past year applied for an internal grant and developed a uh, workshop series and guest speaker series that we called Uplifting Memes. 
Um, and uh, we chose the name Uplifting Memes because um, we wanted to sort of, uh, we said, raise the level of discourse about memes on campus, but also um, an uplifting meme is a actual genre of meme, um, like a wholesome meme uh, intended to, um, you know, sort of raise your spirits, uh, make you feel encouraged or supported. Um, so the reason why I think memes work well um, for interdisciplinary visual literacy workshops is that it's a well-known format that is mostly visual. Um, memes do not have to be visual. We think of this image macro uh, type format um, with an image and words superimposed in some way, uh, but memes can be um, phrases like okay boomer, um, just uttering that uh, phrase um, is uh, part of a sort of uh, meme that is um, sort of uh, taken uh, up space in some uh, public discourse uh, about interactions between generations. Um, but a lot of memes that we think about are uh, actually visual. Um, so it's a well-known visual format um, and students tend to be able to share a vocabulary uh, when they're talking about memes that is not grounded in academic discipline. Um, so students across disciplines uh, are able to talk about memes using similar terminology. Um, also, students uh, are already um, users, sharers, remixers, creators of memes, uh, and that process um, allows us to frame uh, the sort of iteration, uh, creation and sharing of memes as um, a form of scholarly conversation when we cast students as um, participants in the creation process and um, agents of their own scholarship. Uh, so the image here that I have um, to the left is a meme uh, that is part of the uh, who would win uh, format and I have this here to link to know your meme. Um, which is a website that catalogs different meme formats. And so the, I'm not sure if you can actually see Know Your Meme or if it's only showing you my slides. Um, but uh, the purpose of this format is to uh, compare um, uh, to who would win in a hypothetical battle between two opposing subjects. Um, and so in this case, you have uh, someone wearing a pair of earbud headphones, and then you have a security gate. Um, when you walk through a security gate, uh, there's buzzing in your ears. And I actually pulled this um, to uh, sort of prove my point that students are um, creating uh, memes and that they are also, um, they can be more sophisticated rhetorical uh, devices and a form of digital communication. Um, this was posted on a UNCG student account, UNCG memes, and they actually tagged um, our library social media on this uh, to let us know that they don't like it <laughs> when uh, there's buzzing in their ears when they walk through the security gates. Um, so the idea is the security gate wins uh, when they walk through and there's buzzing in their ears. Um, and they tagged us so that we would see uh, this meme. Um, and so a lot of the information um, that I am going to briefly go over is on our project website. And here you can see some of our um, marketing uh, for our fall and spring workshops. We also had planned a juried art contest um, for uh, students to participate um, in uh, where they could win financial prizes and that's uh, or monetary prizes that was um, that and guest speaker honorarias pretty much how we spent the internal um, grant money uh, but our spring programming as you can see the dates was uh, supposed to take place um, right about the time uh, that our campus shut down and so even though we had planned out the lessons um, and we had uh, engaged guest speakers um, the actual uh, events did not take place. Um, but all of that is preserved still on our website, um, so you can check it out. The lesson plans uh, and materials from the first three workshops um, are linked uh, via a LibGuide on the website. Um, my cats are starting to fight in the background, uh, so if you hear some screeching, you can't control cats when you're giving a virtual presentation to 200 people. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jackie, about the poster. 
questions. Um, okay, so uh, this is a detail from a poster that um, I presented with my colleagues at the North Carolina Library Association um, mapping the different workshops. And this is just um, a detail from the poster. The poster has a lot more information um, to uh, different visual literacy um, competency standards from the current uh, 2011 ACRL visual literacy competency standards, um, which is a document that was um, authored and adopted before the framework for information literacy in higher education. Um, and so that is actually something that the visual literacy task force, the current one, we're working on developing a companion document um, that aligns some of these ideas with uh, ideas in the framework. Um, but here you can see how we conceptualized uh, our workshop curricula, mapping to different visual literacy competencies as defined in that document. Um, from finding and accessing needed images and visual media, to designing and creating media, uh, meaningful images, um, to understanding ethical, legal, social, economic issues, uh, evaluating images and their sources, all of that. Um, and so you can see the full poster via that link um, which is go.uncg.edu slash WDIM. And so I'm going to focus now on one of our workshops, um, which we called Finding Meme Inspiration with Public Domain and Creative Commons Media. Um, and so I really uh, summarized quickly the lesson plan, um, which was to introduce and compare public domain and Creative Commons as legal and ethical mechanisms for image use. Um, and so I have some of the slides from that workshop uh, that you'll be able to see in just a moment. Um, but the idea is uh, this workshop started with a brief lecture and guided discussion about public domain and Creative Commons images. Then we posed two challenges to the students in the workshop and provided time for them uh, to actually create memes. Um, and then we ended with a share out um, where students uh, verbalize their selection process um, and their sort of creative thinking about how to turn those images into memes. And so you can see the learning outcomes on the right. We want them to be able to articulate legal and ethical frameworks around public domain and Creative Commons licensed media. We want them to be able to identify probable sources of digital images that will be in the uh, public domain. And we want them to be able to select and creatively interpret public domain images as new and existing meme formats. Um, and you can see that I'm focusing in the learning outcomes on the creation of memes with public domain uh, versus Creative Commons. Um, and I'll go through that in just a second. So um, here's just a sample of these uh, workshop slides. So this is not the entire um, workshop, obviously. And so there are going to be details left out, uh, but um, here you can see introducing the public domain, um, you know, the gist of it for students is that anyone can use public domain media um, without obtaining permission and that because uh, no one uh, owns the works um, legally, they do not have to be attributed. Um, here we're going through how works arrive in the public domain. And so this is just one of the slides with a call out showing that um, it's complicated uh, to determine whether or not something is in the public domain if it's published uh, between 1924 and 1964. Um, and I, in this workshop, show um, students an article about the work done at the New York Public Library to determine that uh, a large percentage, a majority of the books published in that time frame, uh, actually are not within copyright. Um, at this point, but there's no database to query. You have to do title by title checks. Um, and then I would show students examples of images in the public domain um, from various sources. Uh, so here um, I have these hyperlinked when I'm showing them to students as well. Um, an image uh, of Manet in the Met Museum collection. Um, and here they clearly label it uh, as a public domain image. You can download a high resolution image. Um, and then here, uh, this is a songbook cover um, from the New York Public Library's digital collections. Um, and they also have rights information uh, and they link to the Digital Public Library of America. I'm trying to find the rights information telling us 
um, that the New York Public Library believes that this is in the public domain. Uh, and then after introducing Creative Commons and the various different Creative Commons licenses, um, we compare public domain uh, and Creative Commons as uh, legal and ethical frameworks. Um, and so uh, Creative Commons is a proactive framework where creators decide whether or not and how their works can be used, including for commercial purposes, um, and whether or not derivatives can be made of their work. One of the biggest um, pros of using public domain media for memes is that uh, as a legal framework, you can remix and reuse them uh, any way you want to. But here's an example of one of the discussion questions. Um, why would you perhaps use a Creative Commons image uh, for meme making if you wanted to engage in that and attribute it to its original creator? Um, and so we talk with students about how digital images um, of works in the public domain are going to largely be contributed on the internet by large cultural institutions. Um, and they're going to share things from pre-1924. And so these tend to really represent uh, a largely Western, white, heteronormative view of the world, whereas Creative Commons materials are going to represent um, the sort of lived experiences um, and uh, name creators versus um, sort of making broad strokes about uh, the um, experiences and uh, art and images from other parts of the world, uh, like a museum might. Um, and then one of the challenges that we had for them uh, was to make a new version of an existing meme format using a public domain image. And so we provided them via a, a libguide with um, links uh, to collections of public domain media at various cultural institutions for them to look through. Um, and for the meme creation, uh, we have, um, we're at Google campus. So all of our students have access to the Google app suite um, as part of, you know, their campus email is a Gmail account. Um, and so we use Google drawings, which is a really low tech, low barrier um, image creation and manipulation platform. Uh, if you can use Microsoft Paint, you can use Google drawings. Um, and so one of the um, features of memes uh, is that um, the sort of low tech, uh, low effort aesthetic is something um, that is uh, sort of part and parcel of the meme aesthetic. So it works pretty well um, for making memes. Um, and so here I would show them um, an example of an existing meme format. Um, and so this is a meme called, Is This a Pigeon? Um, and you can read about it on Know Your Meme. Uh, but the idea is um, to <laughs> label the image uh, so that um, you're comparing uh, the is this uh, sentence at the bottom with whatever is labeled over the butterfly. In the original meme, uh, this android is saying, is this a pigeon? Because a pigeon also flies. Um, so is this, my cats are really going at it in the background, I'm sorry. Um, they don't like each other together for like 17 years. Um, so, uh, so a butterfly is like a pigeon in that it also flies, but if you've never seen a butterfly before and you've only seen a pigeon, uh, you might say, is this a pigeon? Um, and so on the right, I found this image in the New York Public Library Digital Collections, um, where there is a figure raising a hand and uh, some flying uh, creatures. Um, and so here on the right, uh, or here over the figure, I labeled it me. Um, and then I had drinking too much coffee, staying up reading comics all night on my phone, and asking question, are these good habits? Obviously, they are not good habits. Um, and that is the joke. So um, now I'm going to share one of the uh, works that a student created during the workshop. Um, and so uh, this meme is an existing meme uh, linked here again to know your meme. Uh, the mortifying ordeal of being known, um, which comes from the end of an essay uh, published in the New York Times. Um, <laughs> Uh, completely unrelated to uh, anything really. Um, and so uh, this meme compares, oops, sorry, um, submitting to the mortifying ordeal of being known 
with the rewards of being loved. Uh, so, you know, being known is worth it if you are loved in the end. Um, <laughs> it's kind of uh, hard to articulate philosophically, but it's the kind of thing where you know it when you see it. Um, and so uh, these images came from a uh, collection of baseball cards um, in the Library of Congress uh, photos and pictures collection. Um, and uh, this made me laugh and laugh and laugh when the student um, sent it to me so I could put it up on the screen because there's just something about the expressions on their faces um, that I thought really captured uh, the essence of this meme. Um, but then the student also shared that because these are in the public domain, you could uh, share this meme without having to attribute the images to anyone. Um, but we emphasized throughout uh, the activity that especially if you are um, creating work with public domain images for a uh, academic purpose, um, the difference between legal frameworks around attribution and scholarly frameworks around attribution are completely different. Um, and for scholarly purpose, you always need to attribute ideas um, and information from other sources. Uh, but that also ethically, it's still a good idea to attribute um, source images uh, when you share them. However, uh, if you were to share this on Instagram, you could do that in a caption rather than on the image itself. Uh, ideally with Creative Commons, you want to have a caption on the image saying where it came from. Um, so that brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, and we wanted to field um, some questions uh, from the chat. And I can also tab through um, our sources now. And I saw a question asking um, if we could share the PowerPoint. It's actually all one PowerPoint. And while um, the questions are taking place, I can actually uh, share these out via a link and I'll put a slide up um, with that link so you have access to the slides, if that's okay with Dana and Sarah, and they can unmute themselves and let me know. Yes, that Bye. sounds great. Okay, um, so here are, <laughs> here are some credits. Um, going through credits, uh, more credits, and yet more credits. And like I said, I'm going to right now uh, create a link for this off screen so that you have access to our slides. Um, Maggie, will you go back to the last slide um, that we have, if you don't mind real quick, or I guess I could share my screen. Um, I did go in and um, add those references, or not, okay, second to last slide. No, no references? I don't know. Uh, there, right there, there you go. Okay, um, so somebody had asked earlier in the chat about references, so those were the three that I kind of um, unfortunately sped through, so those are available for you as well. Um, I did see that there was a question um, from Liz earlier about do I have an example of an image that I used for to teach the dig method and how have students responded. So um, I have actually used this with migrant mother. Um, I decided to choose something that like circulates on social media that they might have some familiarity with but not necessarily understand where it came from. Um, I think that the image is going to be very important and it depends on what lesson you're trying to get through. Um, so we also had a discussion about public domain um, and image rights. Um, the students were very interested in if the woman had received any money. Um, so there were a lot of questions. Um, the students did respond that they really um, they liked investigating an image because they had never really been taught to do that before. Um, students who had, were also in this journalism class that had maybe taken an art class or two were a little bit more familiar because we do tend to think about evaluating images within the context of art history or within the art disciplines, you know, um, if you're having a portfolio review. But so these students were kind of they seemed interested uh, about learning and images in different disciplines. So that was a really cool thing um, and why I think it's pretty applicable outside of art librarianship as well. So um, it looks like the next question is for Sarah. So I will turn it over to Sarah. Okay, 
it on my trident. <laughs> Find that one again. Okay, yeah, it's about the, um, any favorite articles or resources that recommend for teaching students more about authority being constructive and contextual and information creation as a process specifically about teaching students um, how images uh, are created and how to make meaningful visual media and images themselves. And yeah, that is a, <laughs> it is a hard thing to do. Let me see if I was able to grasp this link. Um, so that's the link to the bibliography that we have created for this task force, which has over 400 articles in it. Um, and so I was kind of trick click quickly trying to look through and see if there's anything um, that really spoke out to me. Um, and I wasn't able to out of top of my uh, brain find one, but if I do, I will uh, email you. Um, but also I like to look at guidelines for the discipline or the profession and think about how they're using that. So for our architecture, I've used um, guidelines from architecture photographer associations, professional associations, and from uh, the American Institute of Architects professional guidelines and see how they talk about uh, creating. Um, because, you know, then you can kind of make that push with the students that to get and portray that authority themselves um, in their visual communications. Um, they need to know and model themselves um, after those professional guidelines, after, um, you know, those professional trade journals I showed and things like that. So using those as models um, for how to um, portray that authority through their visual communication. Um, I hope that's answered some of that question. Uh, and one thing to note, too, is that we are just three people from the task force. The task force actually has eight. Uh, there are eight of us, and um, we're all working together. The idea with this um, reformed task force is to align the um, current standards, the visual literacy standards, with the framework. So that's what we're working on uh, together as, as a group in its entirety. So um, just wanted to clarify that. Um, we don't have everybody else's names on the presentation, but you can find more information um, about us on the IRIG part of the ACRL website too. So, and if you have any additional questions, of course, our emails are on the screen. So you guys are welcome to email us and I'm happy to answer any questions that you'll have. Um, Maggie, there, I know that you were doing the slides. There is a question for, for you from uh, Carissa, if you wanted to take that. Sure. Um, so the question from Chris, it looks like, um, is about talking to students or engaging students in conversation about legal um, and scholarly frameworks and citation ethics. Yes, I do. And particularly in, the, in these workshops, one um, way to frame that that they have immediate opinions about is um, stealing jokes on Twitter, um, where someone, instead of retweeting uh, a joke that someone has made, will just repost it themselves so that they get all of the credit. Um, they get all of the, the retweets and imaginary internet, um, uh, you know, points um, where people are engaging with their tweet rather than simply crediting the other person by using the mechanism in Twitter uh, that allows you to retweet it so that um, the credit stays with the original person but put it in your feed. Um, and so uh, there's no um, sort of uh, legal or, or sort of financial benefit to stealing jokes, except that some people have gotten, uh, say, um, uh, sponsorships um, because they have a large following because people like their jokes, or um, sometimes they get writing opportunities or stand-up opportunities. Um, but uh, the sort of um, credit, the intellectual credit, um, getting stripped when someone steals your joke um, really resonates with students um, and something that they see uh, happen on social media all the time. Um, pretending like you came up with something uh, when in fact you saw it earlier um, and then reposted it without credit. And so uh, they're able to get that sort of intellectual scholarly implication 
really easily using, again, um, an example outside of discipline um, in a uh, media format that they are already participating in. Um, I'm also seeing, uh, let's see, um, a question from Manya about uh, cultural appropriation, exploitation, and memes in work. Yes, we do. And that's why this is a series of workshops. It's impossible to get um, uh, through all of the sort of aspects around memes. Um, we do that both uh, in a workshop about memes um, uh, as protest art and propaganda, um, talking about um, cultural appropriation, exploitation, and memes. Um, and then also in a workshop on visual um, rhetoric and rhetorical analysis of memes. Um, and we talk about digital blackface, we talk about a lot of the um, elements. One thing that we cover in the public domain workshops um, is uh, not using um, images uh, provided in the public domain from cultural institutions um, that uh, are, oops, sorry, I'm getting a pop-up reminder about another webinar that's starting in eight minutes, um, that uh, represent sacred parts of other people's cultures um, in which creators have been stripped of their indivi uh, individual agency um, uh, because those things do exist in museum collections. Um, but then on the other hand, if you are only using images uh, that represent sort of white Western people, um, then you uh, sort of are reiterating the problem or not reiterating, but uh, reifying the problem. Um, and so there's sort of a trade off. Um, a lot of our students uh, may use images um, as a way of uh, reappropriating um, uh, depictions of their own cultures uh, that they um, want to take ownership over from the public domain. Um, so that is something that, of course, is their decision. Okay. Um, are there any more questions that either of you want to take? Um, so there was a question about news literacy. And so I just why because you I didn't want to interrupt you I just popped in that chapter but yeah I'm happy to chat about news literacy um or visual literacy or how the two intersect um like I said just shoot me an email um and then it looks like um the last question is how often has the topic of assessing dates of image creation come up um instances where the date is difficult to determine um so Personally, when I'm dealing with journalism students who are trying to uh, look at misinformation and date, um, you know, when was the picture actually taken, that can lead through, you know, some different venues and in investigative journalism. So there is a really great source that just came out. It's called the Verification Handbook. Um, Mike Caulfield, I believe, is an editor. Um, and it's, uh, I'll just put that in the chat, it's Verification Handbook. And that talks some about specifically dating journalism photographs, but i um, happy to turn that one over to Sarah and Maggie uh, if y'all have something else that might be helpful there. I will just say that in many formats, um, information about images uh, can be pretty sparse. <laughs> Um, there is, you know, really not set guides, um, good guides for citing visual materials or providing that additional context. Um, and so that is something a lot of times I'll talk with students is don't do that to yourself. <laughs> uh, so when you are posting images or anything online, make sure you're attributing yourself, make sure you're um, getting a Creative Commons license or something like that to show what this image is and, and how it can be used. So I think a lot of times once students start to recognize that, that there are a lot of images are being, you know, posted out there without good sourcing or without additional information, uh, you know, even in professional, 
um, sites and, and formats. Maggie, did you have anything to add on that? Um, we also, yeah, I'll show students, uh, now a cat is playing with something in the background. This is just my best day of uh, quarantine. Um, there are, I'll show students how to reverse image search um, to try to identify the point at which a contemporary image, a born digital image sort of hit the Google results. Um, and for a lot of uh, images um, sometimes that you can't determine who the first person to post something was um, using that method um, and so just showing that it can be really hard to trace a digital image back to its original source um, and I also talk to students a lot it's one of my things um, about uh, metadata and art store um, being contributed by the original uh, institutions that um, gave the images. Um, and so uh, sometimes images have date ranges because the entire collection um, has uh, collection level metadata. Um, sometimes images are debatable. When you're talking about visual art throughout history, um, there will be scholars that disagree on the date of creation of an image. Um, and so uh, sort of, yeah, like Sarah said, um, it's not an easy answer, but we, I think that is a question um, where context sort of depends on how you want to approach it. Um, where is the sort of issue around dates? Um, are you talking about social media? Are you talking about art history? Are you talking about journalism? Um, and sort of approach it that way. Uh, Someone asked a question um, earlier about workshop attendance um, because these were co-curricular um, outside of course, completely voluntary workshops. Um, we uh, had good participation because we worked with uh, faculty who provided extra credit incentives. Um, we also uh, had some swag that we gave out. We had really cool keychains that were phone chargers that worked with both uh, USB-C and Lightning um, that were like $3 a piece that we used some of our grant money, they were branded. Um, and so we got students largely in the door because they were getting um, extra credit uh, from faculty members in media studies, um, studio art, first year writing, um, undergraduate LAS classes that we have at UNCG. Uh, and um, we really pushed it to faculty members who work on social media or some of the related themes um, that the, the series covered. Um, it's really hard without some kind of incentive to get students to come to voluntary co-curricular kind of academic workshops, as you all know. Yes, the extra credit can be a powerful incentive. So. All right, well, I think um, we're just about getting up to three o'clock and it looks like questions have stopped coming in. So I just wanna thank uh, Dana, Sarah and Maggie. That was excellent, super informative. Um, I put a link to a post event evaluation in the chat, but everyone will also receive it in their email if you can all fill that out for us. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for coming and stay safe. Hi guys, thanks for coming.